An eccentric young man is forced to find a job after his mother has a car accident and risks losing the family home. The man, Ignatius Riley. The book, A Confederacy of Dunces. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's, Let's get, get lit! lit. This is Alexis. And this is Kari. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. How are you this week, Kari? Girl, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Have you been doing anything interesting? I have. I'm preparing (laughs) for our uh, big reveal tomorrow. (laughs) Tomorrow morning. (laughs) Tomorrow morning. Well, this is going to be very exciting. Yeah. I'm excited. Me and too. I hope our readers will be just as excited. So quarantine hasn't been useless. We've been um, studying different mood creations and the way certain scents affect us and what makes us feel good, what puts us in a certain mindset. And we've created a line of aromatic experiences. When you read books, <laughs> that's what you call candles. <laughs> Do you always have a candle with you when you read a book? I um I just always candle burn lit. candles. Oh, period. Okay. So yeah. I do. And our candles our candles are extremely um fragrant because we made them to compare to a lot of Parisian brands um that you know I really love, like Diptyque. I really love um Overose. And those are candles you don't even have to light to smell. So it was important for us to create like this new aspect of storytelling, a new dimension of storytelling. So each candle is based on a particular setting in a book that we've read on our show. So on the label, you see uh, which episodes it pertains to. You can either light the candle, read the book or, you know, light the candle and put on our show. And they're called Lytotes. Lytotes. Oh, I love it. I love it. I it's love adorable. it. It's not your average candle. And if you don't know, I mean, I know you know, but you know, readers, if you don't know what a lot of teas is, that's like when you say something is not bad instead of saying it's good or saying, you know, these luxury candles are luxurious and not by accident because it's on purpose. That's a lot of teas. So, <laughs> so we um been searching for sources to find these fragrances, everything from the wax to the fragrances to the wicks to the vessels. Uh, we've been really making use of our quarantine and I can hardly hold my eyes open. I'm so tired. It's such <laughs> a time consuming process. It's yeah. an investment of time to be sure. Yeah, because um, we want them to be worth every you know penny. And I've been burning them. I love them. Um, so, yeah. I'm That's really great. excited. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. excited too. Lido Tees. Lido Fall in love with Lido Tees. And you can follow Love Lido Tees. That's L O V E L I T O T E S. L O V E L I T O T E S on social media, on Instagram and Facebook right now. We're live. Hey, we live. Go to love Lido T- Say it again. We live, baby. <laughs> com, and that's it for the plug but you know we the plug so get your aromatic fragrances inspired by Sula by Toni Morrison Great Gatsby Gatsby. by uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald we got a candle inspired by uh, a future episode Rebecca yeah it's gonna be great wow tomorrow don't miss it yeah, girl. So how are you doing this um, as we enter the second and a half month of quarantine? So, yeah, yeah. What, what, how you doing? <laughs> I still enjoy it. I still oh, yeah. am at peace with being at home. I, I really am. I, I keep waiting for that to, for me to like snap and be like, I just got to get out of here. But yeah. next day feels better than the day before and it's <laughs> it just gets <sighs> quarantine it just gets better and better <laughs> for me I'm, I yeah it does How well about I did you? think I was going back to work on Friday and I don't know I did feel away when I found out I wasn't I love working from home I love it 
However, um, I don't particularly have a job that I hate. So I had right. the mindset to go in on Friday. And so the fact that I'm not and I won't see my coworkers, I miss them. Aww. <laughs> I'm, I'm in sure texting my that. um one of them like 50 times a day. Oh, like, hey girl, what you doing now? Oh, Animal Crossing. That is so interesting. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I know she is like so, over it. Yeah, she's she like, stopped responding three home? days ago. I don't know if her charger works. <laughs> she said this is too much. This Whatever. is too much. You know, I'm friendly. Anyway. You are mm-hmm. friendly. Let me um, light my light toadies. Uh-huh. Well, the good thing about my um work is that they are actively keeping us engaged so we have these virtual coffee breaks we oh, have a cute. question of the week so we're broken up into like um teams of four and then we spend a few minutes 15 to 30 minutes responding to questions that have been um given to us by kind of the person leading and, and that's and an it's exciting it's mm-hmm. that's an exciting part i'm sorry there's Go a little ahead. delay. Okay. There's a, this is an exciting part of quarantine is it for, it's forcing companies with traditional um, ways of doing things to think outside of the box, to communicate with their employees and um, guests and um, clients in a less A.B. Sudarian way. Oh, ah. shout out to the black Emily Dickinson <laughs> for her awesome <laughs> video while wearing our Reed sweatshirt. We I love, love it. You can see that. It was great. On our Instagram. Yep. And yep, the Lit stories. Society pot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, yeah. so let's get into it. Um, okay. Oh, wow. Each week, readers, <laughs> we choose a theme based on the book that we are reading. Mm-hmm. And from this week's book, I came up with how to deal with obnoxious people. <laughs> That's good. So, um, have you ever worked with anybody obnoxious? Not necessarily work with. That could be in your life. How about well, I've, that? I've been a waitress, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I've definitely worked <laughs> with obnoxious people. Yeah. And then I fancy myself an amateur actress and did a um, couple traveling shows on a bus with some players. And yeah, that was, yeah. Yep. Yes. Answer your question. <laughs> I imagine that that was um there what about were you? a few to come out of. I also have worked as a waitress. Um, but I remember my time being joyous. So <laughs> <laughs> I I only did it for like six months and maybe if, if I could think about it, maybe had one or two customers that I felt like we're, I mean, they're really being extra, mm-hmm. but for the most part, it was, um, I didn't feel Smooth like I came across it. But yeah. you have a good attitude. That's a lot of it. No doubt you'll go into that. It's like your attitude when you're yeah. surrounded by obnoxious people. Absolutely. Your I mean, look at this podcast. Everything. You do really well. <laughs> 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 Working with the obnoxious every week. Listen, and for we- the rest of your life. <laughs> We all have to make adjustments. But listen, so I was asking a friend um, if she had worked with anybody obnoxious and she would decide to share her story of Ooh, someone. Gossip. <laughs> she worked with somebody that was very knowledgeable at their job. I think it, sound, it sounded to me like they were essentially the go-to person. Okay. But they lacked tact. She said they weren't clean. They had an, a, a tendency to invade your personal space. And then let's just get into it. There was some inappropriate stuff, too. Oh. He would make racial comments. He would look at women's breasts when they spoke. He you know, made, I had a co-worker that avoided eye contact. And I assumed it was out of shyness, but he would only look at your chest. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> so weird. And then yeah, he would make is. sexual comments to his okay. boss. Oh, he wow. made sexual comments to the boss after she came back from a honeymoon with um came back from her honeymoon. Yeah. She referred to him as intentional intentionally ignorant. Mm. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, she he said, considers that part of the charm of his character is yeah, how seen and offensive he is. That's not 
charming mm-hmm. at all. And she said he would um, go to other people's departments and pile food on a plate so high that it was like a game of Jenga. <laughs> <laughs> I already know who said it because this is this uh, comment is well written and you got a friend that just need to go ahead and be a writer. So I already know who said it. <laughs> so that's to good. me, that seems like very, very extreme, very, in, very extreme. Um, but then an, another friend told the story of a um, of a woman that whenever she was invited to a party, she always took plates of food home before <laughs> all the guests had eaten. I mean, people Ooh. would be in line. She get in line, get her first plate, and get, jump back in line and get another plate. Do you take plates from parties? Uh, no, only when I'm invited to take a plate from a yeah, party. Yeah, if the host says, "Okay, everyone, please take something home." Yeah, don't yeah, just steal yeah. my food. I've seen it. <laughs> don't do it. It happens. It's a thing. <laughs> but so one time, my friend threw a shower, and the woman was invited. But mm-hmm. true to form, she starts making plates before everyone has eaten. And so um, several of the hostess were like, so can you kind of wait until everyone is eat- has eaten? And she ignored them. <gasps> she ignored multiple requests for them to, you know. So they didn't invite her down. again. You're a bad guest. I mean. They asked her to leave. <gasps> they asked her to leave. I love it. <laughs> and you can take your plate with you. <laughs> They asked her to leave. Can you believe it? What did she say? Oh, this game good. Let me get my tea. <laughs> and you give me all these names later, right? Okay, so she what was, happened? She was escorted out. So then Shut she up. she decides that she wants to explain to the guest of honor why she's being asked to leave. Wait, what kind of event is this? <laughs> it's this a, is it's a it's a shower. I think it's a bridal oh shower. My goodness. And so she's and they like, no, stop talking, get out. <laughs> But, you know, I've been at one of your friends' houses and I was escorted out in an ambulance. So that's just what they do. (laughs) They tried to kill me. But that's a story for another day. That is a story for another day. That is truly a story for another day. That's crazy. So, yeah, that that did happen. They asked her to leave and she was escorted out of the home. What you going to do? What are you going to do? So how do you handle um, obnoxious people? How? What do you do? Do you have any suggestions, Kari? Ooh, avoid them. (laughs) Avoid them, especially if they're willingly obnoxious as much as you can. Avoid them. If you work with a boss that is obnoxious in a way that um, crosses lines, try to get another job. That's easier said than done, but just always be looking for another job. Update. You know, life is the longest thing you'll ever do, but it's too short to spend time with obnoxious people especially people who don't respect you and who are nasty yeah who are <laughs> nasty make it basic don't be around nasty people especially with corona because she don't care <laughs> she hop on them and hop off them and get on you and so, get you right at, right on you Mm-mm. with no keep problem. that over there coughing into the air and carrying on yeah it's <laughs> or it's sneezing in your hands what is this <laughs> So listen, I um I went to our favorite place, <laughs> um, Psychology Today, because they always have <laughs> tips and it does seem to be our favorite. I mean, I looked at other um, sites as well. They they kind of had the same top and then some had 20 tips, but I decided to stick with That's the too many. top four. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> Psychology Today have four. Ooh, and it was me. I'm excited. It was an article um, by Susan Krauss. Whitburn, um, PhD. And the first one was to understand the source of your annoyance, which I thought was interesting Mm -hmm. because it really um, has you look at yourself first before you look at the other person. Can you, um, is this person triggering you because of your own personal insecurities? Mm -hmm. Maybe you had some childhood issues and whatever this person said or did triggers that. Mm -hmm. So is it about me? Or is it really about them? I find that's um, often the case with annoying children. (laughs) (laughs) Children that like hug and touch you too much. Oh, that really gets on my nerves. Oh, yeah. Like once once or twice, it's adorable. When it comes to that third hug, now I'm like, so, you know, how are you treated at home? 
What is it you really looking for from me? I can't take you with me. And I really don't want to. Please go over there with the torch. Yeah, it's uh, that's a but that's, that's, that's a just thing. a child. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. more my issue than theirs. Yeah, so that's important to so instead of labeling that kid as obnoxious or annoying, you just yeah. have to be that's like because I'm an only uh, child, I never had to deal with siblings, and I don't want to start in my thirties. <laughs> <laughs> I think my daughter said the same thing. It's too late for siblings. Let's yeah, keep yeah. it moving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the second tip she gave was ignore the person. And so um, the first example I gave you of the man that um, did all that stuff, um, she said her best um, case was ignoring him. That's how she got through it. Um, <laughs> she said one time she was out of the office and he crammed his hand and you know how you have candy jars on the desk sometimes. Yeah. She, he crammed his hand into her candy jar um, so hard it broke the jar. That's wow. ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Wow. But mm. and and you know he was like, oh, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. Uh, I'll pay. She's like, <sighs> just get away. Go away. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like get away. And mm. so sometimes obnoxious people just want a reaction from you, or they just want attention all together. So you have to make a um, make a decision to. Again, ignore that person and then um, and sometimes you have to make a pack with others. So if it's at work, <laughs> then you have to decide together. Let's not engage. You know what I mean? Let's mm-hmm. not respond. Wait, why do you have asking. to avoid? Why do you have to involve other people um, in your decision? Because if everybody is in on it then it lessens the reaction from the obnoxious person. Now you form an immunity. Now I feel like that ain't none of my business. I'll just ignore them. You do what you want. And well, maybe here, I'll have to ignore both of y'all. Well, here's the thing. Cause then um, with other people and your regroup, you also have to refrain from laughing at that person <laughs> and turning it into um, a gossip session and, um, <laughs> and just all be mean. making unwanted <laughs> comments. So then it doesn't turn into an uh, so much of an alliance thing, but really it's more about <laughs> not engaging the obno- obnoxious person. So it does, it doesn't have to be a gossip fest. It, it should <laughs> truly just be avoiding their obnoxious behavior or ignoring it. So, um, and that response will allow the behavior hopefully to diminish on its own. Hopefully. We'll see. That don't work. <laughs> and then um, three was to confront the person as my friend did. They confronted her and exited her from the building. Sometimes <laughs> that is necessary. You can confront in a non-confrontational way. Even you can say, hey, I just wanted to tell you um, this, this and this made me feel like this, this and this or what you did here had this effect. And I don't think that's the effect you intended. I wanted to draw your attention to it because if it continues, then this, this, and this may happen. There's consequences and repercussions with head concussions. (laughs) (laughs) If you keep it up. In the workplace? Man. (laughs) Those law Uh, firms, boy, I tell you. (laughs) Cutthroat. (laughs) Consequences and repercussions, okay? All right, let's go. Uh, So the article kind of referenced um, confronting people with biases. And it suggests that it would be better to have a person um, who doesn't fit the bias confront the obnoxious person versus someone in that group because it could um, it, it helps to avoid exacerbating the issue. What do you mean? Like racism? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so it's or, better or to or have sexism. a black person confront someone no. who's not. No, do not there go. do not have a black person. So in a uh, situation of sexism, it's a not it's better to have a male. Yeah. Um, confront instead of a woman. That's why it's so important to stand up in our principles, no matter who we're around. So if you're at a family dinner and someone says something crazy racist, it is actually your responsibility to either show by your face that that's not funny right. or you're not amused by this or to actually say something to them. I said something um, unknowingly recently in a group and a member of the attacked party <laughs> Um, let me know by their expression that that wasn't okay with them. And the lesson hit home. If it was someone outside of the attacked group, I may mm-hmm. not have gotten it. So, oh. um, you know, either way. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. Let people know bad behavior is not to be tolerated. Yeah. Okay. Even if I'm the one behaving badly, let me know. <laughs> I ain't well, trying to offend people needlessly. <laughs> we all behave badly at one Only point. Only on or, purpose. Yeah. And another. So just call us on our badness okay just yeah. call us out on make it. us better yeah mm-hmm. it, it only serves to make us better um and then the final one was preserve the individual self-esteem i was like oh wow care about that we gotta These be tips concerned are garbage. <laughs> about the other person's self no <laughs> that's not my job however if attitude is everything then yeah, you're going to care about the person to some extent that you're dealing with, okay? Um, The article suggested giving the offending individual the opportunity to talk about themselves, which might bump up their self-esteem, making them feel less threatened or may alter their opinion or at least uh, drop the argument. Now, I'm like, that. that's a lot. No, ma'am. No, that's ma'am. That's a lot That sounds like doing. something your therapist should do for a fee. I'm like... And unless you're paying me... <laughs> I and now have qualified. to care for you in no. the process of your being obnoxious. Mm-mm. But again, maybe if this is like a, a parent, a relative, someone that you have invested time and attention and emotion in, and only maybe. <laughs> well, think about the work environment, though. You can do that in the work environment because yeah. you don't want to be fighting at work, right? So, no. <laughs> so you try That's to. What is the word you try to ease? Not so much appease, but um, like deescalate. Yeah, deescalate the situation, situation. and and that can help. So I got you. Yeah, so that that comes into play. So did do you have any any? Well, you already mentioned your personal ways of avoiding confrontation. Mm -hmm. Go somewhere else, wherever they at. Don't be there. Yeah. So my favorites out of this one is um, ignoring the person and evaluating whether it's your own personal insecurity. Okay. well, let's take a quick break before we get into the details surrounding this week's book. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Welcome. Kari, <laughs> why don't you give us a little context about the book and maybe a little bit about the author, if you have it. Okay, well, this book um, and the author are set in or are, are coming from one of our favorite cities, which is New Orleans. Yeah. You love New Orleans. I did. Well, yeah, I did. Oh, you don't anymore? Tell me. I did. I didn't like that street. So <laughs> you don't like Bourbon Street, I don't like but Bourbon you love Street. the no. feel of New Orleans. Yeah. You love the specific cu- crescent culture. Yeah. yeah you yeah. love Essence Fest. I, I love know. it. I do. I love that. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Well, our author whose name I never wrote down. I think it's like John <laughs> Kennedy Tool. That is correct. <laughs> our author, John Kennedy Tool, was actually born December 17th, 1937, to a middle class family in New Orleans. And It's said that every aspect of his life was controlled by his parents, specifically his mother. So you may see some of that echoed in our protagonist's life in the book. Um, By the age of 16, Toole completed his first novel titled The Neon Bible and sought publication. Now, he says of the book, in 1954, when I was 16, I wrote a book called The Neon Bible, a grim adolescent sociological attack upon the hatreds caused by the various Calvinist religions in the South and the fundamentalist mentality is one of the roots of what was happening in Alabama, etc. The book, of course, was bad, but I sent it off a couple of times anyway. <laughs> in this statement, we see that there's some self-awareness there, but also a lot of confidence. And that was Tool. Um, he won a full scholarship to Tulane when he was just 17 Um, His mother, I think, made him like skip a grade, the first grade, I think. So while at Tulane, Tool filled in for a friend at a job as a hot tamale cart vendor. You also may see that echoed in the book Mm -hmm. and worked at a family owned and operated clothing factory. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Both of these experiences are later adapted into his fiction work, um, The Confederacy of Dunces. He graduated with honors in 1958 and earned a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship to study English literature at Columbia. He earned a master's degree 
in one year, he earned his master's so he could be focused. Um, And he was also probably naturally gifted in a lot of ways when it came to the written word. Okay, so he based the protagonist in part on an old college professor named Bob. And Bob was like, uh, you know, a slovenly dressed, eccentric who behaved in a way that was anything but professional. He was obnoxious, like we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, Riley, in our book, mirrors him in a lot of aspects. Um, Tool took a position as assistant professor in English at the University of Southwestern Louisiana, and people loved him. Students loved him. He was the teacher you'd invite to the party, and everyone would be around him trying to hear his stories because he was known for his, like, quips and his witty repartee. He was just outgoing. And people enjoyed being around him. Uh, Soon he returned to Columbia to pursue a doctoral degree. But in 1961, he was drafted by the army to teach um, Spanish speaking soldiers, I think English. And so during this time, he began writing a Confederacy of Dunces. He became so engrossed in his work that he began to talk and act like Riley, the protagonist. It is said. (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) Yeah. Um, that yeah. you might notice from his name um, that he his mother was probably very attached to a specific president. Well, when John F. Kennedy was shot in November of 1963, Toole did indeed become severely depressed. I mean, imagine the entire nation being so engrossed in the death of someone with your exact name. Mm-hmm. That, that type of uh, repeated message can definitely get to you. Whether or not you have a mental illness, unfortunately, Tool did suffer from a mental illness. Um, Going back, though, uh, when he finished his book, editors and agents agreed that it was wildly funny, but it lacked purpose, many thought. And any writing worth reading must have a point. Mm -hmm. So he took their counsel to heart. He really wanted it published. And so he spent two years working on it based on their feedback. And finally, he threw the manuscript in a closet where it was found after his death. Um, Speaking of his death and mental illness, um, unfortunately, both sides of his family, there were people who suffered from some type of um, mental disability or mental um, issues. And Tool himself became increasingly paranoid, depressed. Um, He sunk into alcoholism. Um, In 1969, after having a fight with his mother, he left home, withdrew $1,500 from the bank. He um, unfortunately took his own life. And so it was around this tragedy that the book, this is the shadow that the book lives in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because after his death, Tool's mom was determined to get that work published. And she shopped it around to several publishers who rejected it. But in 1976, she approached uh, Walker Percy, who's an author in his own right. And he says, now he writes the foreword of the book. And he says, did you read the foreword? Yep. Yep. I thought it was adorable. He, yeah. he was like, everyone's always trying to make me read their stuff. Now he's a <laughs> professor and he's an author. I know people just throwing manuscripts like when he step out the car, yeah. people slapping manuscripts in his face. So he was like, this well, lady would not leave me alone. Just like I our would. last, uh, um, our last, um, oh, the uh, protagonist. And, yeah. um, yeah, the, uh, dear, is, dear committee members, <laughs> dear committee members. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you want to feel validated. You also want the connections that you don't, you haven't had the time in your life to earn <laughs> and you want those quickly through a mentor. So here, Hey, slap. Here's my manuscript. Read it. Is it good? Yep. So he was like, I avoided this woman tools, mom, but she showed up in my office one day and I had <laughs> no recourse, but to read this mess. Of course. And so I was hoping I would open it. It would be so bad that my conscience would be like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, put this away and never look at it again <laughs> and lock your doors. <laughs> so old ladies <laughs> don't bust in with their dead son's manuscripts. <laughs> So he sat down, you know, he started reading a couple pages, then a couple more. Then he started laughing. Then he started reading 10 more pages. Then he was laughing and thinking and the book was done. And he was so angry (laughs) because now he knew he he himself had to champion this book. He was frustrated because it wasn't bad. In fact, it was fantastic. And so with um, Walker Percy's assistance, The Louisiana State University Press published 2,500 copies of A Confederacy of Dunces in 1980. And then a year later, it won the Pulitzer. Now, the Pulitzer is like trying to be hip and cool these days. But this was 1980 and not very many humorous works are winning awards from the Pulitzer people. 
And to this day, it's sold like nearly two million copies. Um, this is a picaresque novel. And that comes from Spanish picaro, which is like a mischievous person, a, um, a rascal, someone who's like witty and gets into stuff and is driven by their own mind. Um, those type of stories usually have like prose fiction that depicts the adventures of one person. It jumps in and out of, I think, first person to tell you a little bit of everyone's story within the book. And it's like Seinfeld. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, this tr- this so, is truly a story about <laughs> nothing. Yeah, it's, it's about nothing. But in that nothing, the sum of the nothing, there is to be something. And I consider the Confederacy of Dunces like, I mean, what's a book that every black person has read? <laughs> Don't ask me. Because you wouldn't have read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, you know, it's like the color purple. It's like the autobiography of Malcolm X. It's like that, but for bros. <laughs> so if you go to any. Is very, that where the um, feedback is where they never mind? Go ahead. <laughs> if you go to any demelinated um, college campus, <laughs> the the English class the who considers themselves something they are holding this book up so that you can see them reading it <laughs> in the quad <laughs> uh, like oh look at you you're reading confederacy of dunces what do you think so it's like that so it comes with a lot of uh i mean there's some stories there right the author yeah. took his own life and then you got people who love it who you don't want to be like or don't see yourself in but, you know, this is a podcast about books and we like to open up our minds. So we and do. our valves. We so do. Here we are. To put Laura's here valve is open. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's it. That's the Confederacy of. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the context. Of that's the author. context. So, you know, I um, read an article from 2013 that said Hollywood has been trying to make this book into a movie since 1980 man john goodman was supposed to be in it at a certain time in his life i think that would have been brilliant yeah but that and, time has passed yeah. so who would play the protagonist now um so today well the at the last of that article and everything i've seen since it was um zach gilfinesse oh yeah no that's okay name. so as i was reading this i was like you know what would make this even funnier? Black people. So I was thinking, <laughs> I thought like Lil Rel. And can we get Loretta Devine as the mama? Because can oh, I tell she you? Would do well. mm-hmm. We are the Slocums. I think that would be great. I would definitely buy that movie, Sight Unseen. Um, oh, my soup's hanging out the window. Get out of here, man. He's great. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I would love to see Little Rel as um, Ignatius Jack Riley and Loretta Devine as his mom. Oh, I'm laughing already. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yikes. Well, thank you for that uh, You're context. Welcome. Um, we appreciate it. Now, would you give us a brief synopsis with no spoilers? Well, that context has made me realize I don't know what a synopsis is. So let's see. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, The life of the sometimes brilliant Ignatius Jack Riley is one comedic tragedy after another. He lives with his mother, Loretta Devine. Dress is funny, (laughs) isn't particularly charming, but has enough self-assurance to compensate for all he's lacking, even if this is only true in his mind. In The Confederacy of Dunces, we follow a particular chapter in his life that involves a hobby, a hot dog, and a pet bird. (laughs) <laughs> written in the ah. 1960s it is somehow a study of 21st century male loneliness and inertia in america yep it's a comedy yikes uh so what were your first thoughts of the book so um i initially when you brought this to my attention i read a couple of things that came up on google right away and i thought oh, okay i chuckled so it was like oh i'm excited about reading this so I was initially excited, still not knowing very much about it. Mm-hmm. I, I thought there were gonna was gonna be a lot of wordplay. Um so yeah, I was initially very excited about reading it. How about you? What were your um first thoughts? Well, like you, I thought this was gonna be an intellectual comedy. 
where I'd have to think like, oh, yes, I see. I see. I see. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Exactly. This wasn't that. So, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I thought. And that's what I went into it thinking. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we appreciate <laughs> that one. Um, so does that mean we're ready to take our deep oh, dive? Yes. Yes. Let's do it. OK, well, let's jump into it. Let's have your deep dive spoilers and all for our book, A Confederacy of Dunces. Part one. Clothes make the man a communist. <laughs> so right away, we meet Ignatius Riley. He's a mountainous man in a green hunting cap. And he's got on like a tight sweater. The button's popping off. Uh, He's tall. He's fat. And I'm going to say fat because they say fat in the book. His hands are like bear paws. And he looks like he smells. Maybe he does. Whatever. He's waiting outside of the D.H. Holmes department store in the beautiful town of New Orleans. Was that? Was it? Yeah. It's okay. I don't know. 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 I'll work on it. Mm -hmm. And he's cranky about waiting. Now, now I told you what this man is like. Guess who he's waiting for? His mama. His mama. (laughs) Of course this man ain't waiting for no adult woman his age. No, he's waiting for his mom. His mom. Um, Yeah, yeah. And um, like I said, he's dressed slovenly, but somehow feels his attire is pragmatic. This man (laughs) is 30 years old. He is his mama's baby. And he's 30. He has one ex-girlfriend, no friends, a master's degree in something, no job, and has only left New Orleans once. That was on a bus trip to Baton Rouge for a job interview. You heard that right. Baton Rouge. That's as far as he's ever gotten out of New Orleans. And it was the worst experience of his life. He'll never leave the city again. Wise decision. Tells that story over and over and over again to (laughs) To anyone anyone who will listen. listen. (laughs) A green hunting cap squeezed the top of the fleshly balloon of a head. The green ear flaps full of large ears and uncut hair. And the fine bristles that grew in the ears themselves stuck out on either side like turn signals indicating two directions at once. Full pursed lips protruded beneath the bushy black mustache and at their corners sank into little folds filled with disapproval and potato chip crumbs. In the shadow under the green visor of the cap, Ignatius J. Riley's supercilious blue and yellow eyes looked down upon the other people waiting under the clock at the D.H. Holmes department store, studying the crowd of people for signs of bad taste in dress. Several of the outfits, Ignatius noticed, were new enough and expensive enough to be properly considered offenses against taste and decency. Possession of anything new or expensive only reflected a person's lack of theology and geometry. It could even cast doubt doubts upon one's soul. Ignatius himself was dressed comfortably and sensibly. The hunting cap prevented head colds. The voluminous tweed trousers were durable and permitted unusually free locomotion. Their pleats and nooks contained pockets of warm, stale air that cooled Ignatius. The plaid flannel shirt made a jacket unnecessary, while the muffler guarded exposed Riley skin between ear flap and collar. The outfit was acceptable by any theological and geometrical standard, however, abstruse and suggested a rich inner life. You got any identification, mister? The policeman asked in a voice that hoped Ignatius was officially unidentified. What? What? Ignatius looked down upon the badge on the blue cop. Who are you? Let me see your driver's license. I don't drive. Will you kindly go away? I'm waiting for my mother. What's this hanging out? Hanging out your bag. What do you think it is, stupid? It's a string for my loot. What's that? The policeman drew back a little. Are you local? Is it the part of the police department to harass me when this city is a flagrant vice capital of the civilized world? Ignatius bellowed over the crowd in front of the store. This city is famous for its gamblers, prostitutes, exhibitionists, antichrists, alcoholics, sodomites, drug addicts, fetishites, onanites, pornographers, frauds, jades, little bugs, and lesbians, all of whom are only too well protected by graft. If you have a moment, I shall endeavor to discuss the crime problem with you, but don't make the mistake of bothering me. Yeah, so this man, Ignatius, he looks like a perv. So a policeman, an officer, Anthony Mancuso, who's about as good as being a policeman, at, at being a policeman, as Ignatius is at being a Casanova, asks Ignatius for identification because he thinks, you know, this guy looks weird. He's probably up to something gross and illegal. 
Well, Ignatius, <laughs> protests loudly, let your hands off me, sir. I'm really working on it. So he protests loudly yes. that he's, I'm waiting for my mother. And the crowd, then now a crowd is gathering because this big, hairy, you know, big, tall guy is like causing a scene with a police officer. What's going on? People are grabbing their um, daiquiris, uh, hurricanes. I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> hurricanes and bourbons. And they like, it's nine o'clock in the morning. What's going on? So um, one old man specifically is like, let your hands off that boy. He's waiting for his mother, communist. And he just keeps calling the police, police officer. officer. Commun- now, we have to say this book was published, what, in the 80s? But it was written like in the 60s, maybe early 70s. So you're going to hear some things. <laughs> some things. From the time. But can I tell you, I'm going to just show my bias a little this is still very relevant. So, you know, keep up. Don't, don't be discouraged. So <laughs> anyway, the old man is like, copper, get, or not copper, communist, <laughs> get your hands off that nice young boy just waiting for his mama. So speaking of the mama, the mama come out. Hey, Loretta Devine. So she comes out of the bakery store she was in and she's like, oh, Ignatius, what have you done? I know you've done something. Because Ignatius is like useless. He's worse than useless. She, he's always causing her stress. And so she comes out the store and she's like, wow, now he's actually getting himself arrested. Um, eventually, the old man's voice that is calling the police officer communist gets louder and louder to the point that Ignatius' mom goes, you're probably the one that caused all this, not my boy Ignatius. <laughs> and so the police officer who we mentioned is really bad at being a police officer is like, well, OK, I'll arrest the old man. And so he leaves Ignatius alone and arrests the old man who's called him a communist. Now, um, what is the officer's name again? Mancuso? Mancuso is really, he's like a rookie on the force and he's really trying to get in good with the head officer, chief of police. I don't know what their titles are. But no one likes him on the force and they all think he's useless. So he's like, maybe if I bring in a real life perv, which this town should be full of, they'll like me and they'll treat me with respect. It doesn't go well for him. Back to Ignatius. At all. So so now the old man and the police officer have dispersed. Miss Riley returns um, to Ignatius and is like, you know, before we get home, uh, let's hop into this strip club and get a cocktail. Now, (laughs) this isn't weird, you guys. Because this is New Orleans and it's specifically the Bourbon Street area. So you know how something can be like a very respectable cafe before, oh, we'll say eight. (laughs) And then at eight o'clock, you better get out of there. Right. Because things going to get crazy, especially during this decade. Not so much anymore. So they go into this um, nice little bar (laughs) called A Night of Joy. And Miss Riley is like really wanted her son to launch you know you heard that term failure to launch when these kids either never go to college or they come back from college and they just never become adults it's not very good but yes so um she wants him to like get married and be normal and get a job so when they sit down for a glass she's also a lush which is an alcoholic if you're not familiar. And so um, sh- they sit down at the bar. And she nudges him like, hey, they got girls in here at night, huh? And he goes, mother, <laughs> look, you get off of me. He's so disgusted by everyone because he views himself as morally right. Yes, he's on his moral time. high horse. Mrs. Riley orders a drink. The bartender tries to get them to leave by being rude, but that has no effect. They're the type of cl- clients that when someone peeks their head into your bar and sees them, they don't come in. So they're like <laughs> bad for business. They probably stink. Anyway, um, back at the night of joy, Ignatius and Miss Riley chat with a Darlene who is a waitress um, trying to get lonely guys to buy these watered down drinks. But what she really wants to be is on stage. She wants to be in a, an exotic, as she says. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> while they're drinking and talking to Darlene, they accidentally spill their drink on a well-dressed man who speaks well. We are to infer by this that this man is a homosexual. (laughs) This is so bad. Okay. So the man is like, also, because when they spill the drink, the man's like, you know, don't worry about cleaning it up. Um, Also, ooh, old lady talking to Ignatius' mom. I love your hat. I'll buy it from you for $15. And Ignatius' mom's like, really? This whole thing? I've had this since Ignatius' communion, but I'll sell it to you. (laughs) And so she sells her hat 
to the gay man at the bar. And Ignatius is just disgusted because he sees this hat as like a little bit of him that his mom is selling. Are you still with us? Because there's more to come. <laughs> the owner of the bar walks in. Her name is Lena Lee. And she shows you up, you sees Ignatius and his mom and yells at everybody. And it's like, I don't know why you let these characters in here, but they obviously running away to real customers. Everybody who's ugly, get out. She was and like, so they get kicked sight. out. The get them out of here. <laughs> she, she kicked came. them out like your friends kicked out that old woman yes. who was stealing ribs at their party. She was repulsed by them. She walked in the door and said, they need to get out. Get them out now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have to tell you, um, maybe I have a problem because I didn't realize Ignatius' mom was a drunk until like the end of the book. Wait, wait, but wait. I, I'm on the same page. She, That's like she listen. just had a couple drinks. How's she equal a drunk? Come on. How is she drunk? <laughs> she sat at that bar with her son and had like a beer and a half because she spilled some of it on the man, the well-dressed man who bought her hat. Right. So I'm thinking she ain't, she hasn't had that much to drink. Well, apparently the woman <laughs> is three sheets to the wind because they get in the car to drive away and she hits a building. <laughs> some of the building falls on her, on the car. They're not injured, but guess who catches them right in the act? That's right. Professor, I mean, Officer Mancuso, dressed in ballet tights. <laughs> now, I know this is confusing. I can't imagine what you're thinking. It, what you're thinking. It. See, OK, can I just say I haven't had anything to drink. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. I just. Yikes. OK, so Officer Mancuso dressed in ballet tights at the insistence of his vengeful sergeant. So Mancuso came into the precinct. With the old man that called him a communist, the old man was like, I've never been arrested before in my life. What would my grandkids think? And um, the sergeant is like, you brought in an old man with grandkids. Get out of here. And from now on, <laughs> you're going to have to wear costumes so that you can catch these pervs that you want to bring in. <laughs> and why are we making you wear costumes? Because we hate your guts and we want you to quit. Unless you do better as a police officer. Oh. Now, oh. <laughs> in the precinct, we also meet Jones. Jones is a character in the book <laughs> and he is going to lead us to part two me and mr jones have a black stereotype thing going on <laughs> so this is mr jones he is a young cool <laughs> black man who always wears glasses and speaks in up talk <laughs> um and in another book this character would be slow-witted or maybe the magical Negro that comes in in the end and saves all the other characters from some ill fate. True. Or maybe he just die first. True. But in this book, everyone is dished out the same level of offense. So everyone being treated so poorly, including the protagonist, makes it all OK. <laughs> so Mr. Jones is in the precinct and he's like, hey, man, whoa, why you got me in here mm, now? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Did that sound crazy? Yes. That's how it is in print in the book. It is throughout the uh, book. But the thing is, Mr. Jones be like dropping some knowledge. So I don't know. It's crazy. So Mr. Jones goes, hey, man, whoa, why you got me in here? And so the officer is like, I know you'd be up to no good. And so Mr. Jones is like, man, black man just living and now I'm in the precinct. I see what your plan is. Your plan is to start following me, arrest me for something and send me to jail for no reason. So what I'm going to do is get out of here and get a job um, where people can see that I'm working so that you can be appeased. Right. So Jones, coincidentally, he doesn't know anyone else in the story, by the way. He goes to our bar to a night of joy night of joy and explains to the owner who just kicked out Ignatius and his mom, Elena Lee, that he needs a job or the police will keep hounding him. Lena's like, OK, you can like clean up around here because in her mind, she's like, I got me somebody that I can pay pennies and who can't quit. Otherwise, the police will arrest them. This is great. However, a bit of backstory. Lena Lee is involved in something really terrible and illegal. <laughs> And Mr. Jones uh, is actually really? no fool. None. He's none the fool. <laughs> yeah. So he's like cleaning up around here. They're treating him badly. He's like, you know what? You keep treating me badly. Maybe I'll just go to the precinct and tell him about these orphans you donating to. <laughs> so a little boy <laughs> comes to the bar every day or every other day to give her, the, Lena Lee, the owner, 
a packet. And Lena says, thank you. Thank you. Please remember to return this to the orphans. And she gives him something. So there's an exchange here. They're saying it's for some orphans. And Mr. Jones is like, these people think I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. You know what? You keep paying me pennies. And maybe I'll tell the precinct that you giving to the orphans. Ain't enough orphans in the world for all you giving. <laughs> <laughs> What's really going on? I ain't stupid. And I'm a, I, and then um, and she's whoa. like, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> whoa. He says, he says, whoa, a lot. Ooh, this a is lot. So bad. And so Lena's like, well, um, Maybe I'll fire you. And he goes, well, maybe I'll get some of my friends out here and we'll be marching and protesting and really driving away your business. And she's like, oh, what am I going to do? I shouldn't have hired this man. Yeah. <laughs> this, this Negro. Yeah. OK, so um, <clears throat> eventually I walked into the bar, Darlene, and Darlene is late because her cockatoo is sick. And Lena Lee doesn't buy as an excuse, but she's like a sick cockatoo. What you going to do? And so Darlene confides in Mr. Jones. I'll just call him Jones. Because I don't even think his name is Mr. Jones. So um, Darlene confides in Jones. Whoa! That, um, you know, I'm serving drinks, but I really want to be a dancer. Like, that's my goal in life. She's serious. And she's so serious and earnest and um, innocent in her way. And she just wants to dance, you guys. So um, Lena also yells at Darlene for encouraging the Rileys the night before to come in the bar. Part three. Get a job, slob. <laughs> so eventually Ignatius's mom um, starts hanging out with the cop and with the cop's aunt. And they form this little like posse. <laughs> and the cop is married. So there's no funny business going on. But he takes like a motherly interest in Ignatius's mom because he visits the house and he see how poorly Ignatius treats his mom. And so the cop is like confiding in her about his life. She's confiding in him. And then he's like, you should meet my aunt. And then so she, he, she meets his aunt. And then they start all going bowling and hanging out and having a good time. And the more Ignatius' mom gets this life outside of the house, the more she realizes that Ignatius, now the mom is controlling and the mom is nagging all the time. But Ignatius is like a liar. He's he's a sponge. He, he's, Disrespectful. He really, He's disrespectful. And so she's like, you know what? You're going to keep living here. You're going to have to get a job. And he's like, oh, my goodness. Will the wheel of fortune <laughs> ever open in my favor? <laughs> I must get a job. This man has a master's degree. OK, he, he could be doing something, but so, he really yeah. isn't good at anything because he's obnoxious. Um, so he he goes out and search for a job. And it fi he finally lands at this place called Levy Pants. No, not Levi, you guys. It's called Levy Pants. And the manager there is Mr. Gonzalez. There's also an old lady there named Trixie. Trixie. <laughs> and, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, now when he walks in, uh, Ignatius sees Gonzalez and Trixie. And right away, his heart becomes connected to Trixie. He even goes home and tells his mom that there is one cute girl at the office <laughs> named Trixie. <laughs> <laughs> it is so you might think so no it's not that Ignatius has some type of fetish for older women right. it's that he has no romantic urgings in his body he's a 30 year old man who's never been attracted to anybody in that way and actually lacks the capability probably to form those type of relationships so what he sees in Trixie is a woman who speaks her own mind because Trixie will fall asleep at her desk wake up and go I'm supposed to be retired <laughs> And then go back to sleep or she'll wake up and go last Christmas. You were supposed to give me a ham. I wanted that ham <laughs> and go back to sleep. <laughs> and he he's like, oh, Trixie speaks her own mind. I'm going to like it here. And so he forms this like attachment with her. Um. Anyway, he like brings her food. It's actually kind of cute. He bought her socks. Trixie, yeah, he like looks after Trixie. If there's a woman in his life right now, it's Trixie. So um, he's pleased with this job. He feels like he has purpose. Now, what he does at Levy Pants, unclear. I, I actually don't know what his job was supposed to be. Maybe it said it in the book, but whatever it was, Ignatius has his own mind. He's that rascal. So he's going to do whatever he wants. And he did. And that's what he does. <laughs> yeah. From painting on the doors to, oh, I got to wrap this up. Oh, unreal. He immediately <laughs> starts a job and does his own thing. Never what he was directed to employed to do. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to go off of my notes and hopefully this works out because I'm running out of time. So 
Around this time when he gets this job at Levy Pants, he also gets a letter from his ex-girlfriend at college. And I'm saying ex-girlfriend, really, they weren't in a romantic relationship. No. She was just a woman who looked relatively normal, but needed. She looked relatively normal and she would spend a lot of time at their house trying to make him her idea of normal. So she might try to kiss him or try to like make him. I don't know, dress normally or whatever. But what she really saw in him is a pet project because she is a very liberal woman that comes from a lot of money and she needs in her life a leper so that she can be someone's savior. So she makes lepers or she makes causes out of things that don't need her. So in this letter, she is telling him, hey, have you started living your life yet? Because I'm living my life and I'm helping the world and the world is better because of me. For example, I've started this play. It's about an uh, interracial marriage. And we found this um, black girl from Harlem to play the lead. And, you know, she's starting to ask a lot of questions about pay. But um, I make her talk about the um, trials that she's been through as a black woman in America, whether or not she wants to talk about it. And I really think she benefits from these sessions. So she's one of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she sees an immigrant on the train and she's like, I can help you. Don't know nothing about him. I don't feel much sympathy for you. You have closed your mind to both love and society. At the moment, my every waking hour is spent in helping some dedicated friends raise money for a bold and shattering movie that they are planning to film about an interracial marriage. Although it will be a low budget number, the script itself is chock full of disturbing truths and has the most fascinating tonalities and ironies. It was written by Shmuel, a boy I've known since Taft High days. Shmuel will also play the husband in the movie. We have found a girl from the streets of Harlem to play the wife. She is such a real, vital person that I've made her my very closest friend. I discuss her racial problems with her constantly, drawing her out even when she doesn't feel like discussing them and I can tell how fervently she appreciates these dialogues with me there is a sick reactionary villain in the script an Irish landlord who refuses to rent to the couple who by this time have been married in this subdued ethical culture ceremony the landlord lives in this little womb room whose walls are covered with pictures of the Pope and stuff like that In other words, the audience will have no trouble reading him as soon as they get one glimpse at that room. We have not cast the landlord yet. You, of course, would be fantastic for the part. You see, Ignatius, if you would just decide to cut the unbiblical cord that binds you to that stagnant city, that mother of yours, and that bed, you could be up here having opportunities like this. Are you interested in the part? We can't pay much, but you can stay with me, Ignatius. I've humored you long enough in our correspondence. Don't write me again until you've taken part. I hate cowards. M. Minkoff. P.S. Also write if you'd like to play the landlord. And so Riley's like, well, I can top that. It's a whole bunch of Negroes where I work. And so he goes into the factory of Levy Pants and he says, I'm taking an interest in this here factory as one of the men from the office. And all the black people are like, whatever. And so he's like, I brought you all a flag and we're going to go in there and we're going to attack Gonzalez and we're going to stop this. Because basically what you're doing ain't no different than um, the plantation that you came from so many decades ago. So we need to revolt. And you're the lowest <laughs> yeah. paid. And you're the lowest and you're the paid. Lowest paid. So. Obviously, we need to revolt around uh, against master and I'm going to help you do it. <laughs> so he walks into the factory and he starts dancing like they do on Soul Train because he watches that show just to talk about how immoral it is. Maybe it's not Soul Train. It's one of these shows where teenagers dance. But he's trying to dance like black people. And then they start laughing. And so he's like, oh, I'm really reach- I'm really getting through to them. <laughs> the factory is a large bond-like structure that houses bolts of fabric, cutting tables, massive sewing machines, and furnaces that provide the steam for the pressing. In my innocence, I suspected that the obscene jazz issuing forth from the loudspeakers on the walls of the factory was at the root of the apathy which I was witnessing amongst the workers. 
The psyche can be bombarded only so much by these rhythms before it begins to crumble and atrophy. Therefore, I found and turned off the switch which controlled the music. This action on my part led to a rather loud and defiantly boorish roar of protest from the collective workers who began to regard me with sullen eyes. So I turned the music on again, smiling broadly and waving amiably in an attempt to acknowledge my poor judgment and to win the workers' confidence. Obviously, continual response to the music had developed within them an almost Pavlovian response to the noise, a response which they believed was pleasure. Having spent countless hours of my life watching those blighted children on television dancing to this sort of music, I knew the physical spasm which it was supposed to elicit, and I attempted my own conservative version of the same on the spot to further pacify the workers. I must admit that my body moved with surprising agility. I am not without an innate sense of rhythm. My ancestors must have been rather outstanding at jigging on the heap. Ignoring the eyes of the workers, I shuffled about beneath one of the loudspeakers, twisting and shouting, mumbling insanely, Go, go, baby, do it. Hear me talking to you. Wow. I knew that I had recovered my ground with them when several began pointing to me and laughing. I laughed back to demonstrate that I, too, shared their high spirits. My downfall occurred, literally. My considerable system, weakened by the gyrations, especially in the region of the knees, at last rebelled and I plummeted to the floor in a senseless attempt at one of those egregiously perverse steps which I had witnessed on the television so many times. The workers seemed rather concerned and helped me up most politely, smiling in the friendliest fashion. I realized then that I had no more to fear concerning my faux pas in turning off their music. And so he comes into work one day with a flag that is going to be the emblem of representation of their cause. And he waves it up and it's his bed sheet from home. It's got nasty stains on nasty it. Nasty marks on it. It's disgusting. And so they're like, and so they're like, well, can we sing um, some spiritual songs while we protest? <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, like well, I, hate, no. I hate those songs, but whatever it takes to motivate you people. And so they start singing spirituals, holding his dirty bed sheets, walking into the office. He goes ahead of them and he's like, OK, attack Gonzalez, attack the manager. And they like, mm, nah, we're going to go back to work. <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> and so while he's doing this, um, I think Mr. Levy, the owner of the factory, gets whiff of this whole protest situation and fires Riley. Now, one more side story. Mr. Levy lives at with his wife, but his wife is in a lot of ways like uh, Riley's mother, except Riley's mother does really want him to succeed. Mrs. Levy does not want her husband to succeed. Yeah. She talks badly about him um, to their children who's away in college, and he feels this type of demasculization at home. He has this company that he inherited from his father that he doesn't even want. His life is just he's like a boat floating in the ocean. He's like, I need some purpose. So I guess I'll skip to the end of the book. Man, I'm just, I'm, this is a shame. It really is a shame. <laughs> okay, let me tie a bow on Ignatius right quick. So Ignatius gets fired from that job. He ends up selling hot dogs. He has a lot of comedic tragedies in the meantime. Um, <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> you want to tell more, but you don't have time. No, I guess I can't. Um, yeah, I'm just tell a little more. So <clears throat> Ignatius gets fired. He ends up selling hot dogs. He ends up eating a lot of those <laughs> hot dogs. Um, he runs into a boy who is actually the boy who's working with the owner of the bar. So remember we said a young boy comes into the bar to like make exchanges with the bar owner. Those are in, indecent photos that the bar owner is selling to children in high school. The so disgusting. the boy picks up these photos sells it to kids at the high school and the bar makes money from that. Mr. Jones finds out about this. Remember Jones is the black man and he's like, you know what? They treat me terribly here. I'm going to make sure that the police know about this. <laughs> and so then we get the climax of the book In the climax of the book. Uh, Darlene has trained, trained her bird to rip off her clothes. <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> 
And so that's supposed to be her show, but no one is good at their job. And so Darlene is like oh on stage. She's supposed to be Scarlett O'Hara. She's is also an acting role. And she's like, um, oh, I'm so pure. And then the bird is supposed to rip off her clothes. But the bird sees Ignatius, <laughs> who has been lured into the bar by Jones. And so instead of doing what he's supposed to do, the bird flies into Ignatius's head. Ignatius backs out into the street and falls down. There are, um, <laughs> there is press there. They take photos. It is published in the paper. It is bad press for the bar. Jones gets fired. He don't care. Um, Ignatius' mom is so horrified, horrified yeah. that her name and her son is in the paper in front of inde- and she says an inde- an indecent place. But she'll remember she took him there that afternoon, <laughs> that one day. But whatever. She's so disgusted. And she is like, okay, that's it. I have to listen to my friends and have you committed. And so she goes up to his room and she's like, Ignatius, boy, I love you. And um, just remember, you know, whatever I do is for you. And he's like, what on earth are you talking about? So he figures out Get her out plan because he knows room. his mom. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> so he knows his mom really well. He figures out her plan. So he uh, grabs a couple of belongings and tries to escape before the mental institution people get there. He opens the door and it's his ex-girlfriend, the one from college. She's come to help him um, be a real man. And he's like, I hate this woman, but I'm so glad she's here right now. He hops in a car with her and they drive off to who knows where. So he's escaped being committed. Um, Mr. Levy, Levi. Levy. Levy, Mr. Levy, owner of Levy Pants, decides that this Ignatius, who, <laughs> which we couldn't talk about, almost got him sued for half a million dollars, even while being fired, represents him in a way. And he's like, this mother of Ignatius is like my wife. So what I'm going to do is liberate myself and I'm going to get rid of my wife and make Livy's pants into Livy's shorts. And we're just going to sell Bermuda shorts. And that's the cause I can get behind. I'm going to take control of the company, add some purpose to my life. And it's going to be great. And then you guys, um, that's the end of the book. <laughs> but listen, For real. it's all in the subtext. And it's like, I guess we'll talk about it. Let's take a break. <laughs> okay. Job. Okay. Can we stop? Can we stop for a second? Okay, Alexis, I'm missing a lot. Please tell me. I mean, this book has so many subplots. <laughs> Please tell me, what do you think um, I missed that I should have talked about? So I also believe that Mr. Levy's wife is yeah. like um, is like Myrna. Ignatius. Myrna is Ignatius' mom. Girl, yeah. Girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Girlfriend, sorry. Yeah, because she's always trying to help people. And she took that personal interest in um, <laughs> oh in goodness. Trixie and tried to make Trixie yeah. feel good about herself. Now, Trixie uh, is old, okay. right? Trixie is so got dementia. Trix- <laughs> Which isn't funny, but in this book, everything is funny. So, yeah, thank you. So, Trixie, who is the old lady at the office, has dementia. Mrs. Levy feels like I'm going to take her home with me and just teach her to be a, you know, have satisfaction in her life by repeating to herself that she's a very attractive woman. <laughs> <laughs> so she has this old woman on her couch going, I'm a very attractive woman. And the woman repeatedly will like slip in and out of lucidness and be like, I hate y'all. Why am I here? Am I'm I a here? very attractive woman. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Levy, it's like, are you done torturing that poor animal? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Listen, this must make no sense to people listening. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. This book. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even going back to the Negro revolt at the factory. <laughs> <laughs> Ignatius is like Ignatius is like attack. I'm a lot like the Negro in some ways, of course. Okay. No, I share a lot with the Negroes because you know I'm scaring people all the time. And I have to um exert a lot of effort to be intimidated. But Negroes scare people and are intimidated just by being themselves. What a privileged people. And so um you know, he feels like, uh, 
I can't. It's fine. Let's just move on. <laughs> Let's just move on. So the point, this is the book. We meet Ignatius in front of that store. He almost gets arrested. He doesn't get, get arrested. He has to get a job where he meets a motley crew of characters. He tries to cause a Negro revolt. Fails. And then he gets fired. It fails. He gets fired. Then he has to sell hot dogs. Eventually, he gets lured into the bar um, that we found him in uh, with his mom drinking beer by Jones. And Jones successfully sets up the bar because cops are going in and out of there all the time, figuring that there's something shady going on. Jones can spot a cop a mile away. And so he's like, yeah, there's something shady going on. And I'm going to open the lid on this whole operation. He does. It's in all the papers. Um he eventually gets hired. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> he eventually gets hired by uh, Mr. Levy. Uh, he wins an award because Mr. Levy needs to give somebody an award so as to boost oh, morale right. at the office. And so he gives it to Jones. I'm so sorry. I'm a mess. And so he gives it to Jones. He hires him in some aspects. So at the end, Jones has a job that hopefully will um, where he'll be treated respectfully because he wants to work. but it's the um, plight of being a black person in America and finding work where, you know, you're, tr you're treated right and you're paid fairly. And so he might have that now in Mr. Levy. That's what we're ending the book to believe. Um, believing when we end the book anyway. Uh, <laughs> and Ignatius uh, escapes the mental institution and that's it. That's it. This has never happened before. I don't know how to end this. Let's just end Let's it. Let's just take a break. Let's take a break. Okay, <laughs> I need to breathe. <laughs> okay. okay, we're back. Alexis, what was your final verdict of A Confederacy of Dunces? And would you recommend this book? Ah. Wow. Um, wow. I did have laughter in the book. Uh, I did. I laughed at I laughed at something. I think I got bored with it because it truly is about nothing. I was. Did you read it or did you listen to it? I did both. I okay. um, was watching it. Excuse me. I was reading it one day and I fell asleep three times reading it. Yikes. Three times Yikes. reading okay. it. And then as I was reading it, I began to think, this is about tool. This is biographical. I just remember oh, to mm. connect all the things that had happened in his life with what was happening to um, Ignatius. The protagonist. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, this is sad. This is more sad than it is funny. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't mm -hmm. um, get behind that. And so um, this book, more than last week's book is truly about <laughs> nothing at a Seinfeld episode gone wrong. So I, <laughs> I got to say, I would not recommend it. Mm -hmm. How about you? So I will tell you, I'm going to go broad strokes and then little details. Okay. This is the funniest book I've ever read. Um, I listened to it all. I, I had the book. But I started listening while I was taking photos. So I thought, I'll just finish it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I laughed till I cried. I laughed till I couldn't breathe. It is crude. It is. Um, in some ways that are unforgivable. And so I would not recommend it. However, I um, genuinely, unlike last week, enjoy this book. <laughs> I felt like it wasn't trying to be something else. And... It was deeply sad. It's not an in-between book. I guess that's what I like. It's not lukewarm. This book is um, strongly gross. This book yep. is strongly sad. Yep. This book is strongly hilarious. Whatever it's going for, it bites into it. Just, it does not look back unapologetically all in. And I appreciate that. It, it, so in that way, to me, it does have a thought and it does have a point. And I can laugh at it, but I can also see how um, loneliness, inertia, and separation from society can really emasculate a man. And I think that's a real thing. It's a real issue, especially now. A lot of men in certain communities don't have a community. And so they live their lives until they're married to someone like Mrs. Levy, 
who wants to see them fail and would in some sick way consider their, their failure her success. Yeah. Boy, she just she brag really about sad. that. Yeah. Or they stay with their moms, fully educated men, overeducated men, and probably some women. But I see this more with men. I feel like women um, form communities more easily and we're encouraged to do so by society. So I can see a man end up. And throughout the book, too, there are some um, hints that are giving you a view of how Ignatius feels about Ignatius. Like there's a point when he just keeps gaining weight and he's just he's already big. But he gets bigger and bigger eating these hot dogs that he ain't paying for that he's supposed to sell. Stealing. He's stealing them. He's stealing the hot dogs from his he's employer. He's stealing them for sure. And he come, um, the cop comes over to visit his mom one day and she offers them donuts and all the jelly's been sucked out <laughs> of them. Disgusting. By Ignatius. So Ignatius is like, um, he's like eating everything inside, trying to, he spends a lot of time trying to comfort himself Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways in a lot of ways (laughs) and he never finds that comfort it's not coming from anyone else and it's not coming from himself the only time he felt that comforting connection was with his dog who died died, um yeah when he was like a preteen and he um, told his mom you know i want to have a funeral for the dog and the mom was kind of like um you know, patronizing him a little bit until he said he wanted the priest to come. And she's like, boy, if you don't throw that dog in the garbage. <laughs> so it's all ha 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 funny. And it is. But it's sad. this was this dog meant so much more to him than anyone respected. That that dog meant a lot. to him. It was like um, and it was a turning point it, in his life. It, the book yeah, identified exactly. it as a turning point in his life. And posthumously, this dog represents the happiness that he only had briefly in his childhood and will never have again, likely. So, I mean, it's a lot there. To me, this book has substance. I I really felt like I can watch Seinfeld. I watch Martin. Not I can. I love these shows (laughs) and they ain't about nothing. Yeah, I enjoy them. They're not a study of anything. At the end, you're not supposed to feel anything. I felt something at the end of this. And maybe because I'm so emotional lately, I have no idea why. (laughs) (laughs) This book is, this is what, this book is why I read books. It's why I read books that don't, that aren't, (laughs) That why I read Not fiction. fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this book is why I read fiction because it is giving me a window into a society that I'm not part of. And it's doing it in a way where I feel educated about a human experience, um, but not in a preachy way. Oh, whose human it experience was, do you feel connected to in this book? This Ignatius. Lonely, yeah, yeah. And Ignatius is like not um he's not an anti hero. You're not supposed to feel like he's redeemable. No. He is a liar too. He is a <laughs> but liar. You ne- but you never hate him because his own pu- being him is punishment enough. <laughs> so there's nothing he can ever do where he's not him. And so I never hate him. <laughs> Cause every day of his life he's being uh met with justice <laughs> by waking up as Ignatius. <laughs> And the characters in the book, I mean, the some of the stuff Jones says, even though he's going, whoa, all the all time. All the time. That was annoying. He is saying some stuff that's like, how did a, a, a white, how did this white man tool, but he's from New Orleans, so he's around a lot of different cultures. But I'm like, how did he have the self-awareness? No, that's not self-awareness. I don't know. How did he understand this particular part of my culture so well Mm. how these it doesn't feel no one in this book is being laughed at except ignatius and his girlfriend and maybe the mom sometimes and the mom so coming at this um suburban liberal idealist the way he did i thought was brilliant and the way he came at black people i thought was also mostly hilarious but also good for a a white author um if that makes sense Where you you don't have you're not apologized. There's no white guilt projected into Jones, and that for me was refreshing. <laughs> no, none you're at not all. Right. He did not care. <laughs> he did not <laughs> care. 
And he didn't try to make Jones save everybody. And he didn't try to make Jones something else. Jones was out for Jones himself. Jones was just Jones. Jones was out for himself. He wore glasses inside. And, you know. They would tell him to take and off. And the police was always after him. And they would tell him to take off his glasses. He was like, nope. He did not for what you paid nope. me. <laughs> I don't get paid to do that. Clean right. that. Open yeah. that door. I mean, his relationship with the boss was <laughs> pretty. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I wouldn't recommend it. Thoroughly enjoyed the book and I'd listen to it again. Okay, well, thank you for that explanation and all the detail. We Mm -hmm. got it. We got it. So next week, we're reading Stolen Lives. (sighs) Okay. I've read this book twice, but it's been like 10 years. Twice? Oh, wow. It's not longer. Okay. Yeah. Because I think you stole it from me and lost it and replaced it. Or maybe that was left to you. That's somebody yeah, else. Yeah, stop making People up stories from about me. Because that's not true <laughs> yeah, at okay. all. Okay. <laughs> that's what we read in next week. Um, nonfiction, you guys. Yeah. This is a nonfiction work. I think it was like the first book chose by Oprah's Book Club. Something like that. No. Back in the day. That's not that's true? That's not true. Well, it was chose by Oprah's Book Club. Are you sure it's not true? Yeah, because I think Sula was. Yep. Yeah, nope. Sorry. There we go. It was a Toni Morrison book. So back to Stolen Wives. It's good. (laughs) So this is a recommendation from Kari oh so long ago that I started reading and never finished. So I'm ready to get back into it. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you for listening to Lit Society. We'll be here next week, Thursday, you guys. We will be. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Honoria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. And love like toadies. Oh, yeah. Don't forget about that. L O V E L I T. Wait, what? <laughs> L-O-V-E-L-I-T-O-T-E-S dot com. Get into it. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, tell a friend about Lit Society Podcast. Visit us at litsocietypod.com for show notes, this week's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, read. read something (laughs) okay that was a mess (laughs) I was waiting till you concluded so I could say that